Hello and welcome to BSG webinars. My name is Dan Carney, Graphic Design Manager at BSG, coming to you from my home office in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Thanks for joining us. This is our 13th episode. Future episodes can be found on our website, as well as a link to video recordings of our past episodes. The page can be found by going to bsgcraftbrewing.com and clicking on the webinars tile, or going directly to bsgcraft.com forward slash webinars. Uh, new episodes usually air every Thursday. Next week, we'll have Todd Leopold from Leopold Brothers. He'll be talking about the newest partnership with BSG and their entire malt offering, so be sure to register now and check that one out. We will also be announcing our Humulus U webinars since we'll not be doing our One Day Hop Symposium in Yakima this year. Those links will be up soon, so please check back to register on our website in the coming days. Uh, now for today's speaker is Juan Medina. Juan is one of our malting scientists from the RAR Technical Center. His talk is titled Making Sense of the Malt COA or Certificate of Analysis. Um, throughout the webinar, please ask questions through the Q&A function center of the toolbar. And Juan has encouraged that you ask questions during his presentation today. So if there are questions after his presentation, we'll also stick around and answer them for you. So you can also follow up questions to webinars at bsgcraft.com. So with that, I would like to introduce Juan. Hi Juan, how are you doing? Hi, good afternoon, doing well. Yes. Um, welcome everyone to the Making Sense of the Malt COA uh, webinar. All right, so yeah, again, I'm Juan Medina, malting scientist at the RAR Technical Center, and um, I've been here for uh, going on six years now, and I'll explain to you all a little bit about the malt COA that you might have seen, and I know uh, people come from a, a broad background and have various experiences. Some people are familiar with the COA, and some people are wondering what it even is. So... Um, The MALT COA is the Certificate of Analysis. And uh, what this is essentially is a report card of the malt quality. This is the outcome of the malting and then the blending of various malt pieces. Uh, what it is is it's an opportunity for brewers to track changes in the malt that they get and to optimize their process. And what we're looking at with the uh, Certificate of a Malt Analysis is the accuracy to the style. So uh, Pilsner malt, versus a Munich malt, for instance, are gonna have very different specs. Uh, based on the intended use, the attributes are gonna have different desired uh, specs. And that at accuracy to style is gonna be important for meeting expectations for brewing performance. Now, the COA has a lot of information and it can really be a hazard for uh, information overload. So again, I do encourage everyone, if you have a question as we go, to please ask. Um, because some people are more familiar with things and some people haven't ever seen any of this. So, uh, or maybe some of it. Um, so the information, the data that we get in the certificate of a malt analysis comes from assays uh, conducted in the laboratory based on the standard methods uh, through the American Society of Brewing Chemists. These are all assays that have been uh, established and agreed upon as an industry standard. And uh, are conducted with confidence uh, from lab to lab. Um, the malt quality is predicated by three major components, and that is going to be the initial barley that we start with. So the protein that is inherent to that barley, the germinative energy, which has to do with the health and vigor of the barley, and then the kernel size. And then in the malting process, we have modification, which is the degree of change uh, we get from raw barley achieved during germination. So that's just how much has it grown essentially during the germination part of the malting process. And uh, two components of modification that will, that will be alluded to are cytolysis and proteolysis. And we'll get to those a little bit further on down. Um, and then the last major component uh, that has to do with the malt quality or that predicates the malt quality is gonna be the kilning after that uh, modification step and that sets the color and can affect the enzymes and then the final moisture. So uh, 
as we analyze the malt, we get a sample from the malt elevator or the malt house and it comes to the lab and it gets divided and sent through various pathways for analysis. Uh, the malt sample undergoes dry analysis in our sample room where we do grading, also called assortment, uh, friability, and bushel weight. And those are assays that are reported. Um, also, we look at purity and clean out and skinned and broken. And those are more uh, analyses that we track for our own uh, understanding of our process success in-house. So purity has to do with just making sure nothing's in there that we don't want in there, clean out, um, you know, if there's dust, uh, and then skin and broken has to do with handling. Um, some, some brewers are very interested in the skin and broken and the clean out, um, but that is something that can be uh, varying from batch to batch too. Um, and then when we have the sample go through the mills, we have two different mills that we use uh, for extracts. So we do a coarse grind and then a fine grind and the coarse grind goes to a Congress wort to give us our coarse grind extract that is compared to the fine grind extract. And the fine grind sample also goes to Congress wort and then is further divided for uh, a cold extract where we uh, look at the enzyme content. And then we have uh, an aliquot of that sample, that fine grind sample goes to a moisture oven where we dry the sample to determine the moisture content and then it goes uh, to a, a total protein analyzer where it's combusted to measure the, the total nitrogen, which has been calculated into total protein. From the Congress mash, we get extract, viscosity, beta-glucan, fan, pH, color, and turbidity. And that comes from a set of instrumentation that analyzes the wort. Um, additionally, there's another coarse grind that's actually done with a coffee grinder, and that is for our Don assay which is a measuring uh, mycotoxin content that carries over from the field. Um, so for physical analyses, we also have uh, an examination where we look at the growth. The, initially, this is done in the malt house. The maltsters will look at the rootlet development and the acrospire length. Um, so this is done visually. And in the lab, we take finished malt and we actually boil it in water and we can look at the kernels, they can become translucent once, they, once, they become, once they've been boiled, and we can actually see the acrospire under the husk. Um, this gives an idea of the general modification of, the, of that growth development. And this is influenced by the barley vigor and, and the malting process, how long it's allowed to proceed. Um, so the acrospire length, uh, generally we like it to, to be uh, three quarters of the length of the whole kernel to uh, the full length of the whole kernel. And that's where we generally find well-modified malt uh, adhering to the specs that most brewers want. Again, this is kind of a, a visual assessment and it's not really reported anymore, but it's a good, um, good measure to track for maltsters. In the, in the physical analyses, again, we have grading. So this is where we take screens and shake them with a shaker and the slotted screens have different uh, hole sizes and the kernels will fall through and we get an idea of the size range of the kernels and the distribution of the kernels. This is important because um, it is related to malt extract. So plumper kernels tend to correlate to higher extract and um, this is predicated by the initial barley size but as malt is produced or as uh, the as the grains are malted they actually do lose plumpness some of that um, material becomes the rootlets and some of it actually becomes carbon dioxide through respiration um, ultimately the 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 grading can be an important measure for a brewer to understand how the mill milling consistency might be affected so a variation in grading might affect the needs of the um, gap setting for the mill, but also uh, changes in grading will correlate to changes in protein and extract ratios. Um, friability is a measure of how the malt crumbles. So what happens here, you can see in that image, the friabilimeter is a machine that applies pressure uh, to the kernels as they rotate in a drum. 
and they get crushed over a period of time. And then we measure the amount of uh, whole kernels and amount of um, larger chunks that aren't removed as dust to the um, perforated drum. This is a general indication of malt modification and uh, homogeneity or uniformity. Um, this, the implication of friability is imp important with uh, milling. Highly friable malt will mill more easily and uh, less friable malt will not mill very well. So, you know, unmalted kernels or dead kernels uh, that don't get crushed in the friability test are also gonna be uh, posing a challenge for milling. Whereas highly friable malt, if it's too friable, produces a lot of fine flour and that can be an issue with loudering. Um, the friability is a, is a good overall indicator of modification and it does correlate with beta-glucan and viscosity and um, is influenced by the malting process and uh, the barley vigor. The specification for friability can vary depending on the desired modification of the, the malt being used. Extract is uh, an important predictor of brew house yield. Now, most brewers are familiar with extract and this is measured uh, by specific gravity. So we uh, measure essentially the density and relate it to the starting volume or starting mass of, of the sample. So uh, generally plumper barley and plumper malt is gonna result with higher extract as, we, as was indicated earlier with the assortment. Um, more plump malt equals more uh, endosperm and a higher proportion of starch in the kernel to embryo. And two row generally tends to have higher extract than six row, although six row barley and malt are becoming a thing of the past. Um, the, the difference there is important to note that the smaller kernels of six row have lower extract because they have less endosperm. And that is a trend that can be um, correlated then with protein too. So uh, lower extract tends to correlate with higher protein. Um, but then higher enzyme development and higher modification tends to increase the extract because the enzymes and are, are allowing the starch to be released into the wort in the mashing process. Um, total protein is a measure of all the protein that is in the malt, and this is predicated by initially the barley protein. The uh, malt protein is a progenitor of enzyme activity and, and uh, is going to set the, the foundation for color production and for yeast nutrients. Um, the malt protein also contributes to the peptides that um, make foam and beer hazes and, and the free amino nitrogen for the yeast. Um, the total protein uh, is often really relegated to the conditions that the barley was grown in. So the fertilization practices and the environmental pressures such as rainfall and heat are going to determine the, the total protein that ends up in the barley. And that can also be variety dependent. Right now, there is a push in, in the breeding community to develop lower protein barley for um, all malt brewers. That is the trend in, the, in North America now, away from adjunct brewing. So um, depending on the use of the malt, the total protein can range quite a bit. All malt brewing. Uh, tends to focus on the lower end of total protein malt, so 9.5%, and then adjunct brewing can be up around 13%, and uh, distiller malts even higher. So what happens in the malting process is that the, the storage proteins are broken down, uh, and that's what we call the proteolysis. The um, larger, chain of, larger chain proteins are broken down into smaller proteins, uh, which include enzymes, and then into peptides and amino acids. Uh, the peptides are um, small chains of amino acids. The 
some proportion of the protein that starts out in the barley is um, flushed into the rootlets, which are removed at the end of the malting process. So there is generally a trend of lower protein in the malt than there was in the barley. Uh, as you can see here in this chart, the amino acids, peptides, and the soluble proteins all contribute different um, functions to the final uh, wort in beer. And, um, and they also, in addition to making yeast food and uh, flavor and stability, the, the peptides and amino acids contribute to color, but the soluble proteins are important to the beer foam and haze. So the soluble protein is the proportion of the protein that has been broken down in the malting process that becomes solubilized in mashing. Um, it is important in that it provides yeast nutrition, but it also is a precursor for color formation. Um, the soluble protein at various sizes will offer different precursors for color formation and also haze formation. Um, and also flavor formation. So the color and the, the flavor is tied together um, with that Maillard reaction where uh, amino acids and, and proteins condense with sugars to form the, the melanoidins. Um, but soluble protein can also combine with uh, polyphenols in the brewing process to form uh, haze uh, particles. And um, this is now becoming very popular. So the, the soluble protein can be important if you want haze, it's an important thing to monitor. If you don't want haze, it's an important thing to monitor. Um, the soluble protein is gonna be predicated by the total protein that was starting, starting in the barley and then the, the degree of modification. So um, a higher initial total protein will allow for a higher potential soluble protein and that is gonna depend on how far along the, the barley is allowed to germinate in the malting process. Um, typically, soluble protein also correlates with free amino nitrogen as they are released in that same proteolysis process. Um, the spec range for soluble protein can vary quite a bit, and it's also important to put it in the context of the, the proportion of soluble to total protein. Um, as we see, the, the S over T or is also called the Colback index. The, so the soluble to, uh, protein, the to total protein ratio is a direct measure of the proteolysis. And uh, this is really a, a strong indication for how far the malting process has gone and, and taken the conversions of proteins. Um, so the, the, the large protein chains are broken down in the smaller ones. And this, this ratio will give you an idea of, of what kind of proportions of smaller proteins there are to larger proteins. Um, these can be small peptides or they can be mid-sized proteins. Some of these are enzymes and some of these are functional proteins. Free amino nitrogen is uh, a measure of amino acids and um, small peptides that are critical for yeast nutrition and proper fermentation, um, but they also have an impact on flavor stability and flavor profile. Again, the free amino nitrogen um, can condense with sugar in the kilning process, but also in the kettle and will form the flavor and color compounds through the Maillard process. Um, Oh, I see some questions here. Um, I'll just finish what I'm going on here and then I'll get to the questions. Um, the free amino nitrogen forms during the proteolysis of the malting process and correlates to soluble protein. And again, that S over T ratio is going to kind of lay the foundation for the proportions of the protein chains, uh, their lengths and the fragments that are formed in, in the proteolysis. Um, just going to just address two questions here about friability. Um,
The question is, uh, how do you account for the change in that 75% friability over time, specifically after the malt is sent out and perhaps stored for several months? Um, I guess I'm not totally clear on the question. Uh, The, the, the friability shouldn't change really over time. It, it may be affected by changes in moisture, um, but the friability will affect uh, storability and handling. If, if malt is too friable, it'll break up in, in transfer and in handling um, with grain handling systems. So that can, that can pr present challenges. Um, so lower friability will, will endure more handling and higher friability will be susceptible to damage in handling. Um, but I guess I don't know if I totally addressed that question. Um, moving on to diastatic power. Um, so this is a measure of all of the enzymatic activities towards starch de degradation to dextrin and sugars. Uh, there are several enzymes. Uh, also on the malt COA, you will see uh, alpha amylase. That is a, an important enzyme that is also contained in the measure of diastatic power. In addition, there's the beta amylase and limit dextrinase. And um, these are important because they uh, are what are the workhorse of the malt in the, in the uh, mash. So the starches in, in intrinsic to the malt and then any adjuncts that are present are going to be degraded by these enzymes. And the, the impact on the final beer is how much alcohol and real extract is realized through the brewing process. Um, so the diastatic power is, is influenced by the protein variety and the malting conditions. So the total protein is going to create the potential for how much enzyme there will be in the malt. So the total protein initially found in the barley, uh, and then the variety of the barley, the genetics are also going to have an influence on how that protein um, is, yields enzymes. Um, the malting process does create novel proteins. So in the process, some proteins are, are, are released from storage uh, proteins, or sorry, some enzymes are released from storage proteins, but then uh, especially alpha amylase does form during germination. It's believed that also that some um, beta amylase is also produced during germination. Uh, so as barley germinates, it, it, the protein content will increase, but then when it gets to the kiln, the green malt then uh, undergoes a lot of heat and the, the high moisture, high heat conditions actually do denature or uh, reduce the activity of the enzymes. So there's a trade-off between um, kilning, so color and diastatic power. Um, so the, the, a lot of times the diastatic power is actually inversely related to color. Uh, the specification range for um, For diastatic power ranges from about 60 to 250 uh, dp. Um, formerly these were measured in degrees Lintner but now it's just dp units and that range is, is for base malts and uh, that uh, upper range would be for uh, distillers malts. Obviously lower dp malts are out there uh, that might also be used for base malts like a, a Munich for instance might be down even lower than 60 Again, the, the range is gonna be important based on the, the intended use of the malt. So you can see here some examples of how the, the different uh, enzymes work. So the alpha amylase attacks the straight chain amylose starch. Um, and, 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 the, and so the, it affects the alpha one, 1,4 linkages and the beta amylase affects the beta 1,4 linkages in starch. And the starch is a polymer of glucose, so uh, simple sugar. And when it's branched, uh, the limit dextrinase is the enzyme that cuts at those branched parts of the starches on the amylopectin. 
the, the branched form of starch. Um, as we see, there are also other um, polysaccharides that exist in the kernel, and they're very important to the malting and brewing process. These are structural polysaccharides. Um, these are the beta-glucans and pentasans that form the cell wall. And these are also glucose polymers. So uh, they just have the beta linkages, uh, beta-1,6 linkages. And uh, the pentasans are, are also referred to as arabinoxylans. They are beta-linked polymers of xylose and arabinose. These are very important because they contribute to the, the structural integrity of the cell wall. And if the beta-glucans and pentasans are not degraded, the, the inside of the cell that contains the starchy endosperm, uh, that contains the starchy granules, uh, they won't be accessible in the brewing process. So uh, modification uh, involves the degradation of the cell wall and leftover cell wall can be an impediment in the brewing process in that uh, these beta-glucans and pentasans are the major contributors to wort viscosity. So uh, loudering issues related to viscosity are often attributed to high beta-glucan. You can see here that the um, cell walls are largely degraded in the transformation from barley to malt. The um, storage proteins also break down. Uh, so this is that term again, cytolysis, the degradation of the cell wall, particularly the structural polysaccharides. Um, and with barley, beta-glucan is, is a major player. And then with uh, wheat and rye, um, there, the pentasans tend to play a higher role in that uh, structural integrity and in the residual wort viscosity. Um, so looking at beta-glucan, Beta-glucan is often seen as kind of a villain in the um, brewing process. If, the, this, if there's a high beta-glucan, uh, people fear that it'll cause slow loudering and filtration, and that can often be the case. Um, beta-glucan does also contribute to colloidal stability and mouthfeel, so haze can be related to beta-glucan. Um, but... Um, Beta-glucan is kind of an interesting monster because it can be of a very broad range of molecular size. So uh, shorter chains of, of glucose or uh, larger chains of beta-glucan. And the, the size of the beta-glucan will have a, a very different effect on the wort and beer. Um, but ultimately, beta-glucan is overall related to when um, inversely related to S over T, uh, and it's proportional to viscosity and relates to turbid wort um, and friability. And then if, if there is a low extract, it tends to correlate to a high beta-glucan. Uh, the beta-glucan range varies quite a bit uh, depending on the intended use of the malt. Um, again, uh, Beta-glucan plays into the viscosity, but the viscosity tends to be a, a better measure, I'd say, of, of how the impact is actually going to be realized in the brewery. So viscosity is a measure of the, the flow of fluid, and how we look at that is um, by dropping a, a tiny little metal uh, ball through a capillary uh, full of wort, and it's hard to see in this picture maybe, but the, the machine here has an arm that tips uh, that tube, that capillary and ball back and forth, and it measures the time it takes for the ball to travel through the wort. Well, that, that indicator, that viscosity measured in centipoise is going to be an indication of, um, of how the, the loudering might be affected in the, in the um, brew house. 
Uh, viscosity is, is largely related to the malting process and uh, the, the genetics and environment of the barley are going to have a major um, effect on the potential beta-glucan and viscosity activity in the malt. Um, so again, beta-glucan can vary quite a bit in size and so this is why viscosity is a better insight as to the brew house performance because small chain beta-glucan at a higher content can have lower viscosity than large chain uh, beta-glucan at a lower concentration. I'm just gonna look here. Uh, there's a question here regarding uh, viscosity in the wort due to beta-glucan. Does this carry over directly into post-ferment beer in a measurable way? And uh, yeah, this the the, the wort viscosity, when it's attributable to beta-glucans, can um, be experienced as a fuller mouthfeel. So a uh, higher beta-glucan content can give that fuller mouthfeel in the final beer. Um, I guess it, in a measurable way, uh, you can measure, I guess, the beer viscosity but I think it's more of a sensory uh, outcome that, that people tend to attribute to higher beta-glucans. Um, and then I'll circle back here to a question about S over T. Could I give an example at each end of the spectrum of S over T values and their implications? Um, so generally, when we're looking at the S over T, if we're on the low end of soluble to total protein ratio, um, we're looking at less modified malt. Now that's gonna typically correspond to higher wort viscosity and lower um, residual fan and lower residual soluble protein. And on the opposite end, high S over T means we're probably gonna have higher fan, uh, lower viscosity uh, and um, and, and the, when the S over T is higher, there's gonna be a larger proportion of small chain um, peptides. And so some of these residual peptides um, can be contributing color in the kettle. So a higher S over T means more precursors for color formation in the kettle, uh, more uh, potential yeast nutrition, but also uh, too much residual soluble protein and too much residual fan that persists after fermentation can have implications of um, that are gonna undermine the flavor stability. So the oxidative um, products of soluble protein and free amino nitrogen do present um, spoilage hazards. Um, back to where we left off here. Uh, here's just a visual depiction of how beta-glucan correlates to viscosity. Um, depending on, on how the barley was malted and how the barley was grown, there's going to be different correlation. And we can see here a six row versus a two row, the correlations can be very different with beta-glucan uh, concentration and viscosity. And again, the key factor is that beta-glucan can vary quite a bit in molecular size. And the higher molecular size is going to contribute much more viscosity um, per molecule. Um, so getting a little bit, this kind of helps uh, relate to that question about S over T. Um, Basically what's happening in the malting process, again, I'll, I'll refer to cytolysis and proteolysis. There's the breakdown of the cell wall, and then there's the breakdown of the proteins. And um, to some extent, they're both very much desired. Uh, however, too much protein can present challenges. And, um, and so uh, there are also formations of uh, fatty acids and uh, spoilage enzymes like lipoxygenase and lipase. Um, these tend to contribute um, spoilage flavors like T2N, uh, which what most people um, 
experience of that papery flavor in oxidized beer. Um, so there's a trade-off between that high S over T and, uh, and the low viscosity. So that's why th there's kind of a, a trade-off, whether you want high S over T or low S over T, that tends to be traded off with low viscosity or high viscosity. Uh, and how much you want soluble protein and free amino nitrogen to persist uh, through fermentation is gonna affect how you wanna look at that spec. Um, color then uh, is another facet that it's kind of um, very much dependent on what you want. That's the the target spec is based on the the style of, of malt that you have and the target beer that you're going for. Um, in the process, malt color comes from essentially the Maillard reaction, the soluble proteins and, and the sugars in the, in the green malt as they're kilned, condense, and they form those uh, Maillard products, uh, with the exception of specialty malts that are roasted, um, then you get caramelization. Um, but uh, color also forms in the kettle, and that's important to remember. Again, that soluble protein can contribute to color formation in the kettle. And, and so that's if, something, if that's something that you're looking for and you want more soluble protein, more, more uh, color formation in the kettle, that's, that's uh, a spec to monitor. If you want less color formation in the kettle, then you probably want less soluble protein. Um, but ultimately, uh, word color is uh, also correlated to flavor. Um, those, those mired products are also flavor not only color. Um, lastly, I'll just touch briefly on moisture. Uh, this relates a little bit to that friability uh, challenge that I was talking about. There's uh, a trade-off of moisture. There's a pretty narrow range that we look at, 3.5 to 5%, and that doesn't really vary much industry-wide. Um, but too low of moisture, and you start to look at uh, grain handling issues where the, the more, the, the kernels do start to break more. And uh, if the moisture is too high, then you look at storability issues. Uh, the enzymes do start to work. Um, you get flavor spoilage and even potentially um, storage pests like uh, weevils that will start to be attracted to higher moisture grains. So uh, there's a lot of information on the COA. And we kind of went over what the different assays are, but I think it's important to try to filter it out based on what makes sense to you. And so I like this little chart that I borrowed from Dr. Evan Evans here that um, you kind of weed out the information that uh, distracts from how the malt is going to affect your experience. And then we kind of focus on the information that is going to be leverageable in the, in the brew house. So again, um, just look, moisture, total protein, uh, extract, uh, the KI, the Colback index, fan, color, viscosity, and friability. These are kind of high value targets. Um, the fine coarse difference, um, beta glucan, these are um, a little more distracting in the, in the sense that there are measures already in the COA that give us the information that we really want um, that correlates there. Uh, here DP is marked as red as a discard because um, there is discussion of a better measure which is the uh, uh, attenuation limit um, and a measure of total um, fermentability well, at this point, all we have is the DP, so I think we still look at the DP very importantly. Um, but it's just kind of a, a kernel to place in your head of trying to filter out the information that you don't need to use. So I say, um, kind of look at it this way. Uh, if variety is important to you, that might be in the case of like, uh, for instance, um, 
uh, Mara cider, for instance, the traditional variety that people attribute so much flavor and history to. Um, but a lot of times the variety for American, North American um, barley is pretty similar. And um, we found that uh, the flavor that you get from the variety is, isn't as important necessarily as the malting process and maybe the environment that the barley is grown in. Um, uh, total protein though is definitely going to be important to discern if you want a high protein or a low protein malt. This is applied in the brew house based on the style that you want to do. So obviously lower protein malt is more apropos for uh, all malt brewing, um, traditional lager brewing and ale brewing. Uh, higher protein, higher total protein malts are great for adjunct brewing. Um, the color, that's totally um, up to the brewer, what, what range the color is gonna be for the beer that you're going for. Um, there isn't a major advantage or disadvantage to select on, but that's just something that you, that's gonna be important to you as a brewer. Um, However, the fan and the S over T, these are things that maybe you don't consider too much and you might wanna look at a little more carefully depending on the beer that you're going for. Because again, the fan is important for that flavor formation, but it also can present challenges for flavor stability. Too much residual fan in the, in the end product is gonna compromise the shelf stability through oxidative processes or over storage time. Um, Compensating for that, I guess, is, is making sure to package with minimal oxygen. Um, but the fan also contributes the precursors for some of those haze formations uh, that you get in combination with the polyphenols from hops. Um, the S over T, again, this is a, a trade-off that you get. So higher S over T uh, equals more modified malt, and that's going to give you uh, a greater abundance of the smaller chain proteins and peptides, and that's gonna also correlate highly with fan. But that's important to consider that um, you might like the higher S over T because it's, uh, that the malt that you have with higher S over T might handle better in the malt house because it's gonna correlate to lower viscosity. But you wanna also consider that there's gonna be um, kettle interactions for color and flavor, but also potential um, color, or sorry, uh, potential physical and flavor stability issues with too much residual soluble protein. But the S over T is a better measure to look at than just the soluble protein alone, because it gives you an idea of how much those smaller chain proteins are there. For the brew house performance, you always want to look at the extract. Uh, if you monitor your COA, the changes over time, you can see whether you need to make adjustments to your recipe. Um, to, to hit your target extract or your yield. Um, and your enzymes are always very important to help you ensure that you're gonna get the conversion in the kettle and um, maybe you can have a shorter or faster brew day depending on um, a higher enzyme content in your malt lot. Um, again, looking at viscosity, I think is a much more uh, efficient way to assess the the brew house performance than just looking at beta glucan and focusing on that is, is very important. You can see the, the friability too is going to correlate to that. But ultimately, I'd say look at these, these uh, hand in hand friability and viscosity for how you're going to have the experience in your brewery with uh, grain handling and then with loudering. Um, again, the, the three amino nitrogen. Uh, is your friend and foe, depending on if it's uh, too abundant or too deficient. I guess with that, I will um, acknowledge my colleagues at the RAR Technical Center, and um, I will address some questions that we have left over here. Well, thank you, Juan. That was great. Um, I also want to emphasize that uh, you know, we will have this recorded and on YouTube soon. So if people wanted to go back through, they can see his presentation and, and hear what he had to say. Um, we do have a couple questions that came through. 
And I'm going to circle back to that original question about uh, friability. And so Cameron Johnson had asked the original question, but then he followed it up with, um, I'm wondering if, say, a shipment of malt is stored in a more humid environment, like a working brewery, if its friability changes in a significant way that might necessitate changing gap settings on the mill or other process changes? Um, yeah, so I think the friability shouldn't really change too much. If you notice a major moisture uptick, um, you might see a, a slight uh, decrease in friability. But I guess the, the way to, to understand that in your brewery is uh, to do a sieve analysis if you're able to. Um, it's really hard to, to say how that's gonna, to predict how that's gonna play out uh, once it leaves the lab for us, I guess. Sure. Yeah, I mean, any environment can change whether you're in Florida or, you know, up in the mountains in Montana, it's gonna be different, so. Um, Another question from Jacob Burnham is, does beta-glucan have a big impact on haze? Example, flaked barley has more beta-glucan than flaked wheat, but we choose to use wheat for hazy IPAs. Right, um, so beta-glucan can have an effect on haze, um, but what seems to be the case is that actually protein and polyphenols are much more important, which is why you like the wheat, because the the wheat uh, presents proteins that are more conducive to that haze production uh, that when they interact with the polyphenols from the hops. Um, so yeah, beta-glucans can affect the haze, but it seems to be that the real driver is actually protein, which is why people like the wheat and the oats. They tend to have lower beta-glucans, but more haze-inducing proteins. Sure. Well, we encourage any more questions if people, oh, we have one that just came in. Uh, Juan, can you explain the mechanism of how the flaking process, say for corn, gelatinizes or slash exposes starches to which we can use it directly in the mash? And he also said, thanks, Juan knows his stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, so what they do is they, um, when, you, when the grains are flaked, um, the moisture, a lot of times they'll treat it with a little bit of steam, uh, and then the heat from the, the, the flaking process actually, um, the heat and the pressure gelatinizes the starches. Um, I guess the question was how, how that benefits use in the, in the mash? Um, it was how the flaking process gelatinizes exposes starches to which we can use it directly in the mash. I mean, that's exactly it. That's the answers in the question. The, the, the flaking process expo uh, does gelatinize the starch so that it doesn't have to be gelatinized in the mash. Um, that is a, an interesting quality metric too, which uh, wasn't addressed in this uh, COA discussion, but um, the, the pasting and gelatinization temperatures of starches are very important. And um, I think there's a lot of research underway to uh, address how that can be leveraged by brewers. So the gelatinization temperature of the starch in the malt, uh, if it's lower or higher than the mash temp is gonna have a, an important bearing on the, the brewing outcome. So when the starch is pre-gelatinized such as in the flaked grains, you don't have to worry about that because all you need to do is get it wet again uh, and the enzymes will work on it. Whereas if the starch is not gelatinized, the enzymes cannot work on it in the mash. Well, excellent. Um, that's it for questions. Uh, we appreciate everybody who asked questions during the webinar as well as right after here. Also wanted to let people know that our COA lookups are on almost all of our websites. You can find them usually at the top above in the uh, home screen. So if you are ever looking for them, please contact CSR or sales manager. They'll help you figure it out. And also if you have any other questions um, that you would like to ask post presentation, uh, we're more than happy to answer them. You can send an email to webinars at, web, at bsgcraft.com. So 
Uh, Juan, thanks again for sharing your expertise and knowledge. I learned too many things today. I will look back through your presentation. That was pretty interesting. And uh, like I said, send us questions if you have them. Also remember, register for future webinars. Be sure to check out Leopold's next week with Todd Leopold joining us and showing us a bunch of new malts. So, and from everyone here at BSG and RAR, thanks for tuning in. I'm Dan Carney and this is Juan and we will see you around. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>